In the fall of 2011, historian and author Richard Norton Smith led a week-long bus tour of New England. On American Artifacts, three stops from that tour along Boston's North Shore, where we learn about maritime history. We'll see the Salem Maritime National Historic Site and the Gloucester Fisherman's Memorial. But first, dating to 1644, Fort Sewell in Marblehead, Massachusetts. This is Marblehead and Fort Sewell. There has been some kind of military installation on this spot since 1644. A um, hundred years later, uh, in anticipation of uh, possible French uh, invasion, it was expanded along the lines of what you see, um, although it was enlarged again after the Revolution and was manned during the uh, War of 1812, which makes a lot of sense if you look at the, if you look at the map. Politically, it doesn't because, of course, uh, the War of 1812 was not popular in New England, and indeed uh, there was even talk of New England seceding uh, from the Union because the war, first of all, Jefferson, before leaving office, had imposed an embargo, a commercial embargo, thinking that um, the United States, a plague on both your houses, the British and the French, and um, a commercial embargo would, in effect, punish the European powers that were stopping American ships, impressing American sailors. In other words, it would be an act of commercial warfare, but it would stop short of military conflict. The following morning, the group stopped in Salem, Massachusetts, at the National Maritime Historic Site and Custom House to learn how Salem figured prominently in shipping, customs collection, and commerce in the early 19th century. This is the Custom House from 1819. Now, this house is not the original one, since we, we've had rented out buildings before for the federal government, and there was one in 1805. Uh, but the importance of the house is not just because it's here, but it's the fact that each one of these custom houses, no matter which one it was, served the same purpose, which was to collect taxes. Now, the biggest complainer in this office came here in the 1840s. That's Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, he has a lot to do with Salem's history. He was born on Union Street on July 4th, 1804. Young Nathaniel Hawthorne grows up here, and he grows up with this romantic view of the sea trade. The, the, the wharves, the ships, the Chinese goods, the millionaires, everything makes Salem almost sparkle in his eyes. He turns to his college buddy, Franklin Pierce, and he says, I need a job. And Franklin Pierce said, okay. He gets a job at the Boston Custom House and eventually says, I want to work closer to home. So they move him to the Salem Custom House. And under James Polk, who was the one that appointed him, he lasts here as long as James Polk was president. But unfortunately for Mr. Hawthorne, in 1849, James Polk was not president. It was a Whig Party member, Zachary Taylor. Well, you can guess what Mr. Taylor's guys did. They found something wrong with everybody and fired them. When that happened, they tried to find something wrong with Hawthorne. And surveyor, well, that's easy enough. Just say that he's taking bribes and things like that. But what they did to try to prove their point, they did what any politician does, turned to the media and had smear campaigns written about him in the newspapers. For Hawthorne, this is the best thing that's ever happened to him because he gets fired in the summer of 1849, goes back to 10 and a half Herbert Street, takes his frustrations, and finally starts writing for the first time in years. And he writes a book called The Scarlet Letter. And when he does that, he says he found the letter A in the attic of this building. Now remember, those offices weren't finished. So that was technically attic space at that time, or makeshift offices, or both. But Hawthorne used his creativity to tie in working here to a Puritan scandalous story. And by doing that, he could complain about working here. And he could complain and give his personal view of the scandal. And for 40 pages, he bashed Salem, everyone that lives in Salem, his coworkers, <laughs> political parties. Now, Hawthorne gets great reviews and bad reviews. Everyone loves the book, initially, because they finally get a viewpoint of the scandal. And then they find out that Puritan story wasn't so bad either. Uh, but everyone except people in Salem. If you came here asking about Hawthorne in the 1860s and 70s, people hated him and he hated them back. Then, 
In the 1920s, we started studying something new in American universities. It's called American literature. We needed American writers. Well, guess who was on the top of that list? It was Mr. Hawthorne. And The Scarlet Letter, the first American novel, as they say. When that happened, the boulevard down the street was renamed in Hawthorne's name. When a statue was put up after him, a hotel was erected in his name. The Turner House, which was Captain Turner's house all the way back from 1668, was renamed almost 300 years later, the House of Seven Gables, because that's what the book was written about. And then this room was saved. If Mr. Hawthorne knew that we had celebrated him so much, he'd roll over in his grave, which is not with the rest of his family and old burying point. It's actually in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in downtown Concord next to his buddies, the Alcotts and the Throws and the Emersons. That evening, the group made their final stop of the day at the Gloucester Fisherman's Memorial, dedicated to the thousands of Gloucester fishermen lost at sea. The fisherman in his oil slicks was chosen appropriately enough uh, to be the memorial. The base contains words from the 107th Psalm, they that go down to the sea in ships. Gloucester has had people living here since 1623. That predates both Boston and Salem. Over the years, it's estimated that as many as 10,000 uh, fishermen have uh, vanished. This has also always been a town friendly to artists. Edward Hopper, Winslow Homer, Child Hessam, Mark Rothko, the sculptor Walker Hancock, all have Gloucester roots. We're on Cape Ann, which is a little finger of land that juts out into the Atlantic, north of Massachusetts Bay, south of the New Hampshire line. And of course, if you've seen The Perfect Storm or read the book, then uh, you've been exposed to Gloucester as well. To learn more and view American Artifacts programs anytime, visit our website, cspan.org slash history. American History TV, all weekend, every weekend, on C-SPAN 3.